Great. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Perfect. So just before I start, I wanted to acknowledge that um, I did a workshop last May with uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning and Own Your Future at Western University. And as a part of that workshop, it was really stressed that we write our own land acknowledgements and think about what it means to us. So what I'm going to share with you today is a land acknowledgement that I wrote based on that workshop. So my name is Elizabeth, and I am a settler of this land, specifically on the land of Tiagin, a Seneca village situated in Baby Point or Baby Point, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I would like to acknowledge the land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples on which we are learning, working, and organizing today. I think it's important to acknowledge the land because throughout my education, I never heard the traditional names of the territories and Indigenous people were talked about in the past tense and all the struggles they faced were in the past tense as well. It is easier to deny Indigenous people their rights if we historicize their struggles and simply pretend they don't exist. As an activist, I would like to take this opportunity to commit myself to the struggle against the systems of oppression that have dispossessed Indigenous peoples of their lands and denied their rights to self-determination. Work that is essential to human rights work across the world today. We are connecting digitally and we need to acknowledge the ways in which technology continues to contribute to colonization. Many of us are connecting through high-speed internet and it is a basic right not afforded to many Indigenous communities. We also must recognize that although technology is an enabler, it leaves a large carbon footprint on the land we share and care for. We acknowledge all the lands that we are calling in from today. And if you'd like to learn more, please visit native-lands.ca. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that, Elizabeth. And now to kick off the event, just a quick introduction on Heather Wackus. I promise you'll get to hear from them, not just me. Uh, so Heather Wackus is a seasoned and really well-respected disability justice advocate with a strong knowledge and belief in human rights legislation. Heather's beliefs include the diverse voices of people must come first and the way we work and organize must reflect the diversity and inclusion of the society we are building. Heather's decentralized and empowering approach to leadership has made her an invaluable acting chair of the Council of Canadians with Disabilities. Quick blurb on CCD, and I will let Heather speak, I promise. Uh, CCD is a social justice organization by and for persons with disabilities advocating for an inclusive and accessible Canada. CCD is a convening body that unites disability advocacy organizations in their activities of law reform, litigation, education, and dialogue with key decision makers. Uh, so Heather, if you just wanna quickly introduce yourself, anything I didn't hit on there, feel free to go ahead. Sorry, can anyone else not hear Heather's? That's just me and I am. Oh, I apologize. I have this fancy uh, mic canceling thing that I can press and I guess I pressed it. It's very That's efficient. great, thank you. You said all you need to say about me. <laughs> awesome, then I will get let you get to the first question. And it's a question Frank actually asked in our morning needs meeting today. Uh, so you often refer to yourself as North of 60. So where did that come from and what does it mean for the future of disability activism? Well, it, it's kind of funny. Years ago, um, I guess I was about 13. Believe it or not, I didn't speak much then. Um, my grandmother was asking me, you know, what are you going to do today? What are you going to do tomorrow? What do you, what do you want for your life? And I told her, I have no idea. I, I don't think I have much of a life. I mean, I was in my 13 year old depressive stage at that point, but I did feel very disconnected. And she said, she, now I understand it as a guided, uh, something that you can guide people through but I didn't know at the time all those kind of fancy terms and she said think of your close your eyes and think of yourself at my age and she said really think about how I've hunched over my cane all of those things you know about me and so it took me a while but I, I did and she said now 
look back at your age now, what do you see? And I said, nothing. And I thought, oh, I am hopeless as a human being. In that moment, I felt so raw that I, I had no purpose. And she said, then granddaughter, fill it up. And it just struck me that I had a future. There was something I could do. I didn't know what I was going to fill it up with. And then about a little under two years ago, I was uh, interviewing somebody who actually is a part of needs. And I said to this person, what do you think um, the basic issues are uh, of the and the the issues in the disability community from your perspective, given that she's less than half my age. I was very interested in that, that generational viewpoint. And she said, from their perspective, the majority of the leadership and people who keep control of the organizations are north of 60. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's me. <laughs> what am I not doing right? What? And I, I started to think about what my grandmother said to me, that I have filled the space. Now I need to open that space so others can fill it for themselves. And it really helped me get a sense of that I have had a full life in advocacy in the movement, in many movements of social justice. And I have a responsibility when I sit in these seats, although I may not be privileged, feel like I come from privilege, I'm sitting in a privileged seat. I am speaking. I need to get out of that seat. I need to make more seats for people to speak from their own truths and their own perspectives. And that is something that is really informed and helped me as I've come back into the movement in Canada to get a better sense of where I belong within it. And it isn't to be the acting chair or the chair of CCD for much longer. It is to help develop so that others who have been pushed to the margins and pushed over the edge and have never been at seats of privilege, are there because it's it, it's not my life that the change I will see. I'm in the winter of my life. I am at a place where I can make say things and they may happen a bit. So I feel very responsible to not be the in front, but to get out of the way. And in order to do that, you don't set people up for failure. You ensure that they are comfortable moving into those positions. Wow. So that's where what I feel is the future for disability activism. A lot of us have a lot of historical context, but we don't need to be in the front. I, your leadership style is just truly so empowering. And thank you so much for bringing others up with you in your work. I know it's easy to say, but from what I've experienced, Heather really does actually do this. Uh, going on to your second question, in your role of acting chair with the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, what do you believe is your greatest responsibility there and your greatest accomplishment so far? Um, I think if you want to go fast, go alone. And many people do that. They just, they look around at the injustice, they look around at what the issues are and they just go for it. And that's great because that, that can really set up a good dialogue. If you wanna go far, we must go together. <laughs> so we always have to have room, no matter where you are, that you set up, um, a resources network, people that you check in with, that you find out, is this where I need to be? Because a lot of us, as we're finding ourselves and finding our place in the world, we are going alone and we're going fast. As we get a better sense of who we are and a better sense of comfortableness with the places, 
it's much easier then to be able to share that with others and be able to hear what they have to say, to actively listen and to not have that sense of um, that you're not important. You actually have a sense that you're part of a, uh, something greater than yourself. And I think, I think that's probably the one area I will interrupt when I see a silo and I see people um, feeling like they have to carry the whole weight of the organization on themselves, where I would rather bring it back to people and be honestly say, it's a we, not an I. And if we are not talking to each other, if we are not listening to each other, and if we are not doing the hard work of maybe having some arguments and working through those things, then we are setting up our, our organizations and the way we do business the same way that uh, the systems that oppress us have been set up because that's what we know. So of course we go to that as our default place. I try to engage and I think as a as the acting chair, one of my things is to build consensus and to ask people what they think. Now originally when I started asking people, they said, what? You're asking me? I'm not on the executive. I'm not da 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 da. da. No, you are the heart. You're the heartbeat of the movement, what you have to say is more important than any title any of us might have, because we are equal. I'm just as oppressed and just as happy and just as, uh, as uh, have input as you do. It isn't a hierarchy, it's, it's flat. And that's where I use the metaphor of uh, come around the fire. I build a fire and those who wish to come are welcome. Now, sometimes people get too close to that fire and get a little hot. <laughs> and some people are distant from the fire and get cold and you don't hear them. So a fire keeper is really important to ensure that people are able to get too hot and able to get too cold and can change seats and can get smoke blown in their face and feel like they're totally disconnected. All of those metaphors help us understand what it's like to actually have to grow as a human being and then be able to reach out to each other to find ways of, um, managing and coping is that helpful that that is the most helpful thank you and if no. i can get people when i work in a group or with a, a process when i hear people saying look what we did look what we accomplished i know i i was helpful in getting there it's not what did you know, so and so do as our leader. <laughs> I don't like that. That sets us up and disempowers us. And I really like it when people say, we did this, or I, I contributed this to what we did. Like that's also important to own your own empowerment and to bring, be acknowledging that. Wow, I mean, just your willingness to address oppressive systems and have those difficult conversations is so refreshing. I know a lot of us, especially with consultations, we try to be palatable to make them hear us, but I know that's not the most effective tactic. Uh, and then that goes into our next question. Uh, in your work, you're often involved in consultations. What are these consultations like and how meaningful and representative are they? There, this is one of the, the things I never sit well. <laughs> it's kind of a pain in my butt when I hear the word consultation. There's a certain type of arrogance around consultation, the term, for me, only because of the historical context after 66 years. Um, but it's usually the oppressor or a person within an oppressive system, not them personally. And that's really important to recognize when I talk about these things. I'm not necessarily talking about the extreme fringes of racist 
people and people like that. I'm just talking about regular Canadians in oppressive systems, whether they be government or organizational structures or business structures. Not many people wake up in the morning thinking, how can I oppress a person? Like it's just not a conscious thing. But it's something we all do just because that's the that's the societies we grew up in, many of us. So um, when I think of consultation, I think of a hierarchy of people coming to our level and saying, now teach me, make me understand just what is it you want or need. Or... And so we go through hoops, unpaid hoops, to people who are being paid very well and groups of them around the table being paid very well. And then we pour our hearts out, we give them everything we got, we've traveled miles and miles to be there, we've spent a lot of money that to, for babysitters or people to drive us places, we've somehow managed to get to these consultations or gone to a friend's house to use their internet because we can't afford one and, and get and we say our piece and we do all that. And we go, oh, the revolution has begun. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> 33 years later, <laughs> a piece of legislation finally hits the table. And it's nothing like what we said. <laughs> and that is my problem with consultation. They are important. Don't get me wrong. Mind you, I've always had this thought, like they used to say, what if there was a war and no one showed up? Well, I feel like that around consultation. What if they had a consultation and none of us showed up? What would they do then? And so for me, I would like to flip the script. The, ex, the, uh, char the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that we fought for back then in the 70s, 80s, mind you, it led up. 100 years before that, were originally written without people with disabilities. We added that in or fought to get it added in. And that's why it's at the end. And, and people with mental and, and physical disabilities. I don't particularly like the arrogance of that, but at least it's in there. We'll worry about changing that wording later. Then led to a lot of change we expected as a result of that, didn't realize we had to fight for it. Every inch of it, painfully un, unfunded and made some change. CCD was very much at that time, one of the few uh, disability organizations of people with disabilities and did a lot of work um, in terms of policy and, and driving change and, and human rights complaints. And going to uh, the Supreme Court of Canada several times to make incremental changes that have resulted in now the Accessible Canada Act also resulted in 2010 assigning the Convention on the Rights of Disabilities, uh, pe persons with disabilities. So the arc of change went into a legal framework. That is what's happened and into our laws. What has not changed is the actual issues. <laughs> we spent so much time just getting a legal standing and getting legal um, opinion and legal, and, um, uh, Supreme Court rulings that we can advance now. But now that we're here, guess who's in control of deciding what those changes will be? The people who phone us up to come and consult. So I would like to flip it. I would like us to have the funding, us to have a level playing field of empowerment so that we can meet with each other. We can give money to groups that are never, ever heard from never ever funded to bring themselves together to have their own voice. And that's where I think we need to move. We need to move to get that power and balance dealt with so that I'm not speaking on behalf of 5,000 people. I shouldn't be. It's arrogant to think I could. And so we need to have more funding with to even that out and uh, otherwise, we're going to keep showing up, 
getting our $25 Amazon gift card at times. And then they go, the, the, the structure goes away and tries to fit us in to their weird structure of oppression. And that's colonialist structures, that discriminating structures, because if they weren't, we wouldn't be discriminated against, right? So did I go on too long? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, like as, and we've talked about this, Heather and I quite a lot, but as someone who's 20, I think my generation really forgets about how much struggle went into getting disability rights in the charter and mainstream discussions, even if it's not perfect. I mean, I've benefited, I've lived in an entire world where disability rights were ingrained in the charter because of your generation's work. So it's just such an honor to hear about like your perspectives and experiences uh, and just know the younger generation really appreciates it. And then just moving on to the next question, you are so passionate about the importance of by and for organizations. Uh, can you share why this is important to you and to disability activism in general? I think we have to remember that the fight for rights, human rights, comes about from those who have been pushed to the margin. I say pushed, we didn't go there willingly. Nobody woke up and said, I want to be poor, destitute, and have all sorts of government people up my bum looking at me all the time. No, none of us thought that. What, what happens is the people who decide how far we get is not us. <laughs> and if I hear it's going to take time one more time, <laughs> I just like, uh, yeah, I've just only had 66 years of waiting for you to get around to it. Um, only we can decide what's right for us individually. And we are the only ones who have rights in the charter. Uh, it's we're the rights holders, not corporate charities. And I talk about corporate charities, not about the people within them again, but their structure. You have CNIB one, over 100 years old. Blind people, low vision people in this country should no longer need a CNIB. We should be the most educated, the most owners of businesses, the most integrated into society. Had they developed a process that was not based on charity model. And here's the difference. We have a medical model that assume, that tells us what's wrong with us. Then we have a charity model that looks after us. That is ableism. That is about seeing us as less than. I am able body. My body works as much as it's able to, as anybody else's does. It is when I walk out my door that the structures of society, that the attitudes of people, and that the uh, environment disable me. And that's a whole different construct in which to come at this. And it's important to understand it so that we feel like we know we are okay. We're not somehow an alien. We're not deformed. We're not deficient. I always say I gained my blindness, not that I lost my vision. Um, and that's kind of why I'm so passionate about people with disabilities, the organizations they run. We should be the ones at the table. We are the only rights holders. So why are other groups speaking on our behalf and why are structures going to them to speak on our behalf? And I'm not saying they don't have a place in our landscape of the, of the disability community, but we must be center and our words and our direction must be taken with the most weight. Is that, did that answer it? Everything you say is perfect. Uh, yeah, that's, I'm going to need time to process that, but like always just so incredible, very, very empowering, great perspective. I do want to say one more thing about that. That is the one thing that I get goosebumps thinking about needs and the students and the post-secondary work you're doing is that I grew up at a time when we weren't allowed to be seen in public. We were seen as a burden. And if her family walked us down the street in a wheelchair or something, it was, oh, how's poor Annie today? And all that kind of verbiage that comes from ableism and assuming, oh, there's something wrong with you. And what a bit, you know, 
cross to bear for your family. I come from that. I come from an, uh, an assumption that we either need to be fixed or looked after, not that we are whole in and of ourselves. So when I see non-institutionalization happening, although it's still happening in Nova Scotia and some other places, and with the uh, uh, mental uh, health laws in some provinces, um, we, lo we lost our agency. We never had an agency. Now I see so many people having agency and standing up and saying, I'm okay just how I am. And even though it's not easy going to post-secondary, there's all sorts of barriers and ways to make you not continue, including maybe taking longer to get degrees. So your, your uh, student loans are astronomical compared to regular folk. Um, I am so happy that whatever we were able to do, how little incremental it was, that you're at a time where there's some technology that is assistive rather than preventative <laughs> of, of people with disabilities being able to go through post-secondary and, and find their own passion as a person, not going through it because, oh, if I become a social worker, maybe I can help bring people up. You're actually following your passion, doing all sorts of great stuff that has nothing to do with disability, which is so cool. Because I'll tell you, it's a political statement to walk into a room, to roll into a room, to tap into a room, to walk in with an interpreter. It makes people uncomfortable and they need to be. And they need to check their own ingredients, why they're uncomfortable, because we walked in the room. And when we walk in the room and we're their boss, that's even better. That's even better. So that's what I see so powerful about needs and, and, and what's going on is because you're, you're empowering, you're empowered yourselves because you've never thought of it any other way. And it's so cool. Oh my, I mean, I love working for needs, obviously, but the way you speak about needs just makes me so honored to be part of this team. And speaking as a disabled post-secondary student myself, I think it's an exciting time to be disabled in post-secondary. It's, it's hard and it's impossible at times, but I feel like we're realizing our full agency and potential in ways society never kind of led us before. So, and once again, all because of, you know, your generation's work and contributions to our rights, we couldn't have done it without that. So, uh, and then just the big scary question, how do you make real and sustainable change within a colonialist, bureaucratic, systemically oppressive system without burning out? Oh, you burn out. It just goes with the territory. You can't help but burn out. I mean, somebody happened to be on a, a global symposium this week and it went for 24 hours and they went on it for 24 solid hours you you do stuff you know you'll go all night and get that report and you wordsmith it and argue over words and you get there and you go oh that was great now i've got to sleep for a week but the next thing came up the next day and somehow you do that I think you have to live uh, in a way, people talk about balance, but there's no way that being having an oppressive system around you and always having to educate and elevate other people, which can be very draining on us all. Um, we're already in an imbalance, if it were, we don't have a norm. So we have to call each other and say, hey, I'm going to pick this up for you. You take some time out. And sometimes our time out, we don't know what to do with it because just by going out, we, we run into the same systemic and, and environmental things that, that make us disabled. So sometimes it's exhausting because you just think, wow, how am I going to get through this? And I think the... Uh, there was a woman named um, Sandra Carpenter, and I think she said it really well. She said, the first subversive thing I ever did was live. 
<laughs> and you just got to put your head in the game that this is part of our life. This is just as um, important and just as um, uh, affecting us as our disability does out there. So we, we have to just make room for it and, and allow for there's going to be nights we can't sleep because we're thinking too much. Okay. People tell you to meditate. And all I do when I meditate most of the time is think about all the things I would be thinking about when I'm sleeping, but maybe it's helping. I don't know. I think we have to find the things we like to do outside of the disability community and create networks of people that will support us in that. I have a friend who is a Paralympic swimmer, um, quite, a, I guess, before the turn of the century. That seems weird to say that. And uh, she swims. She swims in a master's class. She's the only person with a disability in it, but she goes every week. And it's just something that she enjoys. It's, it's her passion. She likes it but we will burn out and we have to see the signs of burning out. Sometimes it's, we just get um, too quick. Like we, we get kind of edgy and people, oh, you better go have a V8 and chill out, you know? <laughs> but that's, that's, we have to accept that from each other. And we have to say, if someone says, look, I need to get out because the other things I'm doing that I love in my life, like going to school, are have to take precedence. So we have to learn no. And we have to learn to accept that from each other and not say, okay, I accept your no, but will you just do this? <laughs> and that's where the power and balance comes from too, is we have a system that doesn't fund us so we can have somebody else or we can get paid ourselves to do this work when we are working part-time and also going to school. So those are those challenges, but accept that you will burn out, but know when you're getting there. You know, when you haven't washed your hair in a week or you've sat in a Zoom call in the same um, uh, t-shirt for the last week, I mean, I can, t I probably could name off 47 things that we all do that we're, we wouldn't tell each other we do necessarily. But this scarf, this scarf saved me and three other scarves for Zoom calls because I'll interchange them. So I look like I've got different clothes on. And some days I swear, didn't I just wear that? <laughs> I mean, I feel like in my personal experience, I, a lot of non-disabled people see us and see the burnout, but they don't see all the additional, you know, work we're putting in to inform our communities and lift each other up. So never thought about it before. I will use that as an excuse to kind of go for burnout more often. Please don't tell Frank who was in the Zoom call, but wow. Wow. I, I'm going to embrace the burnout. Embrace it. It's just part of the gig. It's part of the gig like being tired from our disability or whatever. It's just part of the gig. Normalize it for yourself and know when you need to just say, ah, I'm, I'm going for a walk instead of the Zoom call. The world will not collapse because you weren't at a consultation, because you weren't at that um, uh, board meeting. It won't, honest. And once you realize that you are one piece of a huge amount of people who are totally as capable as you are, then that's when you realize we're in a movement together. It doesn't all fall on my shoulders. Other people, they'll figure it out. <laughs> I don't have to try to make it all, all pretty and boxed in. No, nope, sorry, can't make it today. Something came up. Doesn't matter what came up. Maybe you came up. You were first that day. So take it. I just know that's why when we go together, other people can step in just as easily. And knowing that you are dispensable is probably the best gift we can give ourselves. That we, if we're not there, it's like water, right? You throw something in, in a pond, like a rock, it displaces, but after, you know, within a few seconds, it, it, it covers up and you never knew that you were there. And that's also important to know you're part of something, you're not the something. You're part of the movement, you are not the movement. I wanna tell you there is uh, a quote that 
uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm, I'm very much into history and I'm very much into um, historical people that nobody's ever heard of. Those are my favorite people because they have evoked amazing change, but paid a big, big price. And she said, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, had quoted her, but she said, and now she was born in 1792. So we're not talking yesterday. We're talking 1792, thinking about where women were at then. There was the church or, your, your, uh, or a man was in charge of you. And, so, and you had your role, especially as a woman. Now, she was from Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina. Her family owned slaves. She didn't like it. She thought it was wrong. She comes from privilege. She said, but I ask no favors for my sex. I surrender not our claim to equality. All I ask of our brethren is that they will take their feet from off our necks and permit us to stand upright. That's 1792 when she was born. She died in 1873, which means she was very much coming from privilege. She always had food. She lived nearly 100 years. But her ability and her sister's ability to say no. And not only were they in the abolitionist movement and start were very big uh, funders of it, <laughs> which was quite interesting when you see people of privilege um, doing that, they paid a heavy toll for it. They were disenfranchised from their church, from their, uh, from the men, <laughs> like they were outcasts, but they were okay with that because it was what they believed in. And so my parting kind of answer to this too, is that although we talk, people class each other out, and sometimes that I don't like that, but we talk about having privileged seats and coming from privilege and not coming, all of those things. However, if the people who are in those privileged seats and have privilege do not work with us and are not un, and are not part of our allyship, we won't change the systemic things. It's people like her that change the systemic things. And I think that's important that a better society is better for all of us, not just me, not just you, but all of us. And it, it helps now with COVID. I think many of you are going to do historical work on history changing work on the impact of COVID, not just in our community, which I think we, we've done really well with, um, no matter what they threw at us, no matter how they forgot about us, we're still here. We are still here. And yes, we've lost some. And we need to honor that they died. And they died alone, many, and hurting. And at the same, and at the same time, we have resilience anyway for having disabilities. And I believe we are capable of also, yes, it's been hard on the disability community. And yes, we kept going through it. We found ways to help each other get through it. And I think that's the most important thing I can say is let's come out of COVID knowing that although we lost people to suicide, we lost people to neglect, we lost people to COVID and neglect, we also are intact as a movement still. Just processing, I, oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I would love to open the floor to all of our participants. Uh, if you'd like to ask Heather any questions, uh, feel free to like raise your hand, say something in the text box, uh, unmute yourself. I'm sure we have a lot of questions and a lot of things to say after Heather's incredible answers, so. Yeah, Elizabeth, if you want to ask a question. Yeah, thank you so much, Heather. That was an incredible presentation. I am also processing and digesting. 
Um, I'm just wondering if you'd be open to sharing any thoughts around um, some of the challenges that the disability community continues to experience with accessible and affordable housing, attendant care, and then as a result, how so many of, of us in our community are inappropriately placed in, in institutional settings. I think you touched on it a bit with the Nova Scotia case. I'm not sure if I think you're the same person, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that if you're comfortable and open to sharing. Well, I think it it's around that, still that belief that there's something wrong with us and we're somehow separate from society. So we need to be separated. There's, there's always that ableist thinking, but it's also a hierarchy <laughs> and Many of us in the community in BC, many people at the beginning of, the, of COVID lost the little bit of home support they had. They just quit showing up and people were left for days, many in their beds without any supports, without any way to contact anybody. And so we had a real um, sense that Although we had the illusion that we were things were getting better, in actual fact, it wasn't because we weren't included even in the response to COVID. They forgot. They kept saying, uh, what was Trudeau saying? Uh, contributing Canadians will not be left behind. Well, we're contributing. We were left behind. It's a heck of a lot of work still. And we, if we don't keep up the push forward, what we hope is pushing forward, we will, it will keep repeating itself. And that's part of the problem that wears us out generationally, is that the same issues I fought 50 years ago are being fought now continuously, because if you don't maintain your rights, you lose them. And every time you get a new generation of, of uh, bureaucrats and um, people um, in power in government, you have to re-educate them all over again. It isn't systemic change. And that's a big part of the issue. Um, is that helpful? Like it's not, it, it's still bad. It's still yeah, bad. No, that's, that's really helpful. And, and I think, you know, you, you touched on it. I think, I think it's such a challenge too when you don't have home care supports and your only alternative is is moving into somewhere that's that's um, you know not not age appropriate and, and I think the Nova Scotia case I don't know the last name but I think the first name is Vicky um, she really touched on some of those challenges. The other part of the piece of that and I think it's important is that the, the idea that the federal government right now is talking about poverty reduction, not the end of poverty, tells you where they're really at. <laughs> they're, they're saying, well, we'll make your poverty a little easier. Maybe you won't be looking for the food bank on, you know, the 12th of, of, uh, uh, of the month. You'll wait till the 15th of the month to have to go to the food bank. Like that's, it's so um, critical that we understand that. And think of it as a hamster wheel. When I started, the hamster wheel was quite small. You could see it coming. Now we get the illusion of a bigger hamster wheel. We think we've made it somewhere. And we have. But don't get me wrong. We have because of the structural changes um, in our laws. But now we have to fight to get them in action, um, but we, we're in a bigger hamster wheel, but we need off ramps. And that's where I see the ACA and really the, the um, CRPD are off ramps. What is it? What are the strategic things we need to do to get to form those off ramps and move society to that thinking? And it's going to be helpful that so many non-disabled people in this country all of a sudden got face to face with oppression, got face to face with not being cared about, got face to face with actually losing their homes, losing family members. It was a horrible comeuppance for society, but it certainly equalized a lot of people to go, how precious 
their they thought their job was that it would be there forever like in the airline industry we heard um from families who both worked in the industry lost their jobs and with three months their their home was gone and they didn't know where to go with that and their bills and their children all of a sudden the change happened overnight for many of them and so I think we can capitalize on that understanding and help people grow to understand the system has to change for all of us. If any of us are hurting, then we all hurt because it won't be long before they come for you too. <laughs> and I see that Anne has their hand up. Anne, if you'd like to uh, ask Heather a question. Well, it's not so much a question, Heather. It's a Happy to hear somebody else that's been working away and doing stuff for your population. Um, I've been in this, the business of this for quite some years too. And it's so refreshing to hear the words of someone else. And you also live in my province too. So, mm, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and, and another thing that I had to comment on about was the, um, the business of during the pandemic, um, I haven't been bored at all. I've been busy. Uh, lots of Zooms, lots of learning things, uh, techno you know, like uh, meeting up with people in different technological uh, areas that I never knew about. And, uh, and, and then also getting involved in some more projects, which are um, very dear to my heart. And uh i'm actually been taking a course too which i said after i got my master's i wasn't going to do any more courses but i've been uh, working on a course through the mental health with mental health for the provincial uh bc and uh, also mentoring some people in victoria through around mental health issues so i haven't been bored at all during the pandemic i've just also been increasing my knowledge and giving of my knowledge, but I just want to thank you so much for speaking today, Heather. It, it's very gratifying to hear your words. Thank oh, thank you. you. If I could say something about um, where we sit now, and I think that's important. Um, look around your own life and see what changes you want to make in it personally, then push out. What are the next things you want to change? Uh, whether it be in an organization, whether it be at your school, whether it be with your families, push out once you have an understanding of, and those are your off ramps to the hamster wheel you have. And then in your organizations, your organizational structures, are they really fitting with how you feel um, breathing life into your own uh, disability organizational structures. How, how are they organized? Are they organized to be oppressive? Or are they organized to enlighten and change and, and can help model the change? We may not know what we want, but we know what we don't want. And so we can start to try to figure out different methods of organizing, working with each other, building consensus, talking about things. Uh, back in the day, we used to call it conscious raising groups. But it's about that so that we lead the way in what a new, a, uh, a more inclusive society means for us. We're not asking government to do it for us. We need to know what it is so that we call the shots. And that's really key. That's that's power. Awesome. And then just two last questions. I know we're getting close to time. Uh, one question from Amy in the chat is how do you take care of your soul as you are doing this work? Know that you're right. Stand in your own truth. Screw the other stuff. We're right to expect inclusion. We're right to expect respect. We're right to expect a Canada that includes us and is working towards equity. That, stand in that truth, then you're good. The other stuff like uh, Obama did is just 
brush it off your shoulders. It's, it's crap. It's fuzz. It means nothing. That's why I, I feel centered in who I am when I speak to you. I may not be right. You may not agree with me and that's okay. I'm not right fighting for you two. I'm sharing with what I've learned and know from my perspective. And that is as equal as the prime minister's perspective, probably more just saying. Oh, um, your humor just, uh, it, it is, it's been a long day and your humor just energizes me so much. Uh, Dormy, if you'd like to ask a question. Thank you so much. And Heather Dormy um, from the Rick Hansen Foundation, I find your presentations always enormously powerful and inspiring. Um, like you, I'm very passionate about the post-secondary sector because I think that is where the next generation um, is going to carry the day for us. And I just wanted to get your take. And I think you've talked about it a little bit too in terms of those off ramps and how do we help that next generation? How do we you know, help the leaders of tomorrow of the, as those of us who have been part of this journey for a long time and trying to show how we can shift that world? The, the comments you made about the consultation processes and you know the infrastructure that we all face daily and you know so I don't want to leave that as the legacy for the champions of tomorrow so I guess if, if you had as your you know the top three things we need to do as leaders currently and I heard your comment too about not being front and center this is about allowing others to come forward with their voices I'd be really interested just to hear what you think we can do to really um lift up and support um, the next generation of leaders? I think the important thing is to recognize they are leaders now. They're not next, they're here now. I think the second thing is to get out of the way and not assume we are leaders. We, we filled the space, we've done what we can and that we need to listen and, and step back and give space for others to, to bring their voices forward. I think it's really important to remember that every child has their own agency as a person. They are not a little person waiting in waiting. They are a person already. And at each stages of our lives, as we know more, we do differently, we do more. And recognizing that youth are always there, always in leadership, always have something to say, always view the world from their perspective as equally as we do. And mm -hmm. once we get past that up and down mm -hmm. and more level, then we can sit around the fire as equals and mm -hmm. say, okay, I'm going to be quiet now. You guys tell me. Because when I was young, I led, I had, I, found my voice. I started to fill up that space my grandmother told me to. And that's what I would say to you. Also, because of the structure you're in as a foundation, it's very easy to be disconnected from people who live that every day in poverty. And I'll tell you, it is so easy to get disconnected and bought off because government gives you money sometimes refusing the money and saying no this money would be better used at community mm -hmm. for for community to develop their own uh viewpoints mm -hmm. not that my organization needs to survive on it mm -hmm. that's a big change you, mm -hmm. when you ask people who are in positions like yourselves to say hmm maybe our need to keep in existence in the way we have is more mm -hmm. important than the individual group's right, right and responsibility to build their own voice and viewpoint. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to go, okay, yeah. we can't get e equity if we're not part of building that equity within our own yeah. movement. And like yeah. I say, the landscape is big and there's room for everybody, yeah. but I the agree. rights holders must come first. Yeah. Totally agree. Thank you so much, Heather. Awesome. And I will second that. Thank you, because it's almost fun. And I will be honest, I have a class, so I'm going to wrap this up real quick. Uh, before I start doing shameless promotions for needs, Heather, any last words? That sounds ominous. Last words for this event. Okay. At the end of the winter of my life, if there is a tombstone for me, you will see written on it, 
if changing the world isn't fun, why bother? And I give that to you. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy each other. Enjoy the fights. Enjoy the opportunity when we were so often in the past pushed away and, and shuddered and silenced. Enjoy that we have this and enjoy each other. You are just so phenomenal. I, wow, the fact that I get to talk to you just is blowing my mind. Uh, and not just shameless, shameless promotions that are pre-scripted, that it's really breaking the vibe of this. Thank you again so much, Heather. Truly touching, empowering, enlightening perspectives. Uh, and now shameless promotions. Uh, so our Accessibility Resilience Program and Student Awards Program are both accepting applications. I will drop links to applications form in the chat box below. Uh, we do also have another upcoming event, the last one of the winter season. It is our third virtual access for all panel, uh, March 4th, 12 p.m. EST. We're gonna be joined by representatives from University of New Brunswick, UVic, UNB, and Mohawk College. So follow us on all of our social media for updates and upcoming event information. Heads up to anyone with the screen reader. A lot of links are gonna be dropped in the chat. So again, thank you all so much for joining us and thank you so much, Heather, for your time. Uh, pleasure as always. Oh, and Frank, you are good to stop recording. <laughs>